Hey guys, welcome to this week's FAQ and Freebie Friday. Now for those of you new to the channel, these videos are all about answering your health related questions. So if you have a question concerning your health, something pertaining to diet or nutrition, Chinese medicine, herbs, supplements, or really anything related to health and wellness, and you would like our help in answering your questions, all you have to do is leave those questions in the comment section below, and we'll be answering those based on popularity, the questions that we feel will be the most beneficial to the group overall, and of course, questions that we are capable of answering. And something else really great about these videos is that every week from the comment section, we select one lucky person to win a free bag of tonic herbs or medicinal mushrooms. And even if you don't have a health question for us this week, but you're interested in winning some free herbs, all you have to do to be entered to win is simply subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't yet already, give this video a thumbs up, and then just drop any comment or question in the comment section below. And with all that being said, let's get to this week's questions. All right, so our first question is an interesting one, something I haven't talked about before, and it reads, what are some of the ways that one can naturally rebuild stem cells, specifically to rejuvenate the reproductive system, such as the ovaries? All right, so this is obviously a rather complex question and could have a very complex and in-depth answer because we're talking about the renewal of cells, and our bodies are comprised of cells. Every tissue, every organ, every gland, Every part of your body is just a massive collection of hundreds of trillions of cells. So the topic of cell renewal is going to involve basically every aspect of life, at least if you're looking at health and biology from a holistic perspective. So it's not just your diet, it's not just medications, but really everything that you are exposed to, every experience, your physical environment, the intrinsic environment, the what's happening inside of your biology, definitely your diet, exercise, your psychological health. All of these things are going to be directly affecting every single cell in your body and either supporting or hindering that cell's ability to renew and regenerate. So obviously we could get very in depth. We could talk about so many different things that affect our cells and their ability to renew, to regenerate, to multiply. But fortunately there are a few very simple factors involving mechanisms. So things in your life that can either support the process, the healthy process of cell renewal without any sort of mutations or hinder it. So like I normally do, I want to go through some of the things that you're going to want to avoid, some of the causative inhibiting factors to proper cell renewal. So these are things that basically damage your mitochondria and make your cell uh, less efficient at renewing. So whether this is actually directly impairing your cell's ability to multiply and renew or impairing it in a way where there's not just cellular multiplication but also the accumulation of cellular debris which would result in mutations, so things like tumors and cancers. So the fact of the matter is even cancer cells multiply. So when you're considering the topic of cell renewal and how to stimulate the production of stem cells, remember there is this idea that cancer cells have stem cells too. So it's not just about stimulating the multiplication process of cells. As we'll talk about in a moment, stress can actually be a factor that causes your cells to multiply. But this might not be the best way to go about things because cellular multiplication or the renewal or division of cells through stress, although it might stimulate the production of new stem cells, could also hinder or mutate this process resulting in, again, the accumulation of cellular debris and mutated cells. So generally speaking, the things that cause stress to your body are the things that also, again, hinder the functioning of the mitochondria, their ability to produce protective substances like progesterone, and their ability to actually multiply in a healthy way. So some of the common things that are known to actually hinder mitochondrial function, which would also hinder normal cellular division, looking first at your environment, are going to be stressful environments. So environments that are really cold and that lack a lot of light. So environmentally speaking, really cold, really dark environments are going to damage the mitochondria, ultimately impair their ability to properly multiply, as well as impair their ability to produce progesterone, which leaves them exposed or vulnerable to high levels of cortisol, which just further contribute to their inability to function properly. So this is just one example of stress. This is an environmental stress, but keep in mind there are other environmental stressors. Even if you don't live in a dark, cold climate, there are tons of modern day toxins from 
the industrialization of our planet. So if you're living by a power plant or if you're living near some sort of chemical factory or if you're just surrounded by EMFs and tons of radiation or even if in your own home you have Wi-Fi and you leave that on all the time and you're always in front of a computer screen. These are all examples of environmental stressors that are known to actually suppress mitochondrial respiration and the cell's ability to properly renew and multiply. And then in terms of diet, the accumulation of polyunsaturated fats, whether that's through consuming things like vegetable oil, like canola oil, and all the unhealthy rancid plant fats, or you just have a greater accumulation of free circulating fatty acids that happen to be unsaturated from chronic stress, so basically any sort of catabolism in the body from high levels of cortisol can cause a greater accumulation of free circulating fatty acids. Also fasting for too long and being too low calorie or just being famine or starved in any way can increase the circulation of free circulating fatty acids, which when combined with a high level of oxygen can actually also damage your mitochondria by causing oxidative stress. Now more specifically speaking, looking at some of the chemical substances our bodies produce under stress as causative factors for damaged mitochondria and improper cell renewal or stem cell production. So these are things that are generally produced under these forms of stress, so the environmental stress, the dietary stress, and other lifestyle stress. We have substances like nitric oxide, which is usually stimulated by estrogen, any of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, histamine, which is also usually stimulated by the production of estrogen, and of course, cortisol. All of these substances are generally stressful because they can interfere with the mitochondria's ability to respirate, which can cause the cell to become damaged, and then obviously the cell can't properly renew. What it will do though is multiply, but in a more stressful or mutated fashion, which is usually what contributes to the formation of tumors and cancerous cells. So something to understand, and as I touched on a moment ago, what's interesting is that stress, and particularly estrogen, can actually cause your cells to multiply and to produce stem cells. So for example, estrogen, which has the primary function of making oxygen unavailable for your mitochondria, can actually induce this stress state where your cells in an adaptive response will multiply and divide to sort of adapt to the stress. Similar in a way that you know, if you're under stress as an organism, you might get a surge of energy via adrenaline or stress to cope with that stress and to escape that stress. But this isn't the healthiest way to get your energy or to double your energy, if you will. So what's interesting is that stress, or particularly estrogen, can induce this hypoxic state, this oxygen-deprived state, which may cause stem cells to be produced or to increase the production of stem cells, but this usually results in the accumulation of cellular debris. And this is simply because although estrogen can stimulate the production of stem cells, it does so at the expense of mitochondrial energy production. So it's stimulating the cell to divide, but it's impairing the overall cell's ability to produce energy, which is going to impair your cell's ability to actually clean out any sort of cellular debris, which is a process referred to as phagocytosis. So this is a process of basically removing bacteria or cellular debris, and this process is impaired by all of these stressors that I just mentioned. So the exposure to subnormal temperatures or colder climates, the lack of light or the exposure to darkness, and even unsaturated fatty acids, all which basically increase the production of cortisol, can all suppress phagocytosis, which makes your body less efficient at clearing out cellular debris, which is going to mutate the whole production of new stem cells and cell growth or cell renewal. So although stress might induce the production of new stem cells and cause your cell to divide, it's also impairing your body's ability to remove any sort of cellular debris through that division process, that cell division process, which is going to lead to mutations. So when asking the question, how do you stimulate the production of new stem cells? You can do it in two different ways. You can do it through stressful mechanisms or stressful mannerisms or through healthy ways. So now considering all of that, the things that generally promote phagocytosis and proper or healthy cell renewal in the production of stem cells are usually the things that are opposite to everything I just mentioned. So going through the list in order, in terms of environment, you want an environment that is generally warmer, if you can. So if you live in a colder place like I do half of the year, you just want to make sure you're staying warm. So dressing warm, uh, going in an infrared sauna if you can, or just keeping your thyroid 
thyroid function high. Uh, the other thing is you want to make sure that you're getting enough light. So during the winter time, you want to make sure you're still getting sunlight, even if it's cold. Just go outside every single day to get that light exposure on your skin to keep your metabolism high and your mitochondria functioning. Otherwise, you're going to want to use like a red light therapy machine or expose yourself to a bright incandescent bulb, which you can get for a couple of dollars, again, to keep the metabolism high. Also, things like vitamin D3 are essential for all the growth processes in the body. So vitamin D3 does stimulate the production of new stem cells in a healthy and normal mannerism. So if you're not getting the sunlight, you're going to want to make sure you're at least supplementing with a high quality vitamin D3 along with vitamin K2. And then in terms of diet, you're going to want to avoid the polyunsaturated fats and any of the foods that tend to suppress thyroid function will also suppress mitochondrial respiration and your cells ability to produce new stem cells. And then the last thing I'd recommend is the use of adaptogenic herbs like KSM 66 ashwagandha, Inca biloba, rhodiola, or something like that that tends to lower cortisol because remember a lot of the things that I'm talking about here, their basic effect is that they increase cortisol and it's the cortisol that tends to interfere with phagocytosis and proper cellular debris removal and the production of new healthy stem cells. So anything that's going to lower cortisol and increase progesterone, which ashwagandha will do, is going to be very beneficial. So I'd say in general, the things you're going to want to do is make sure you're getting enough adequate sunlight, natural light, or use a red light therapy machine. When it's cold out, do things to keep your body warm and your metabolism high. Avoid anti-thyroid foods like polyunsaturated fats and the foods we talk about in our thyroid course or the dietary recommendations in any of our courses tend to be those that support the health of the thyroid. And then other than that, using herbs like ashwagandha that lower the production of stress hormones like cortisol will all support your body ability to produce new stem cells and to renew and regenerate in a holistic way. But specifically speaking to the ovaries and the reproductive system, the only thing I have to say there is that things like the liver and the adrenals and usually the sex organs and most of your internal organs with the exception of the intestines all renew at a much slower rate than the intestines and the skin. So your skin and your intestines tend to renew and uh, have a cellular turnover rate that's much higher than the other organs. So regenerating the ovaries may take a little bit longer than let's say regenerating the skin from inflammation, which is why you're gonna really wanna adhere to these things, these tips for a long period of time. And I think the thing you're really gonna wanna focus on is getting your progesterone levels back into normal ranges. It's a very protective substance or hormone in the body it not only inhibits the catabolism of stress and stress hormones like cortisol, which would break down and damage things like the ovaries, but it's also generally anabolic and should help promote the production of new stem cells. So the KSM 66 ashwagandha I think is a must in this way and can be very beneficial. And watching our video on how to increase progesterone should be very helpful as well. All right, so getting to our second question, this question reads, I remember you saying melatonin is a stress hormone. I'm curious to know what are your thoughts about sleep and melatonin is melatonin anyway needed for good sleep? Okay, so if you haven't yet already, definitely watch this video because I'll talk about all this stuff in greater detail. But the basic thing is that yes, you're gonna secrete melatonin and other stress hormones while you're sleeping. Remember, all the hormones are essential in the body. It's just about a balance. And generally speaking, you want a greater production or level of hormones like the thyroid hormone, progesterone, and other protective hormones to that of things like cortisol and melatonin, which tend to rise under stress. And the reason they rise while you're sleeping is because of the lack of light. And obviously, your body tends to get colder while you're sleeping. And this is all part of the rejuvenative process. But as long as you have a higher metabolism or a higher production of these other hormones to the stress hormones, you're gonna be fine. So melatonin is obviously essential in a certain degree, in a certain level, to slow down the metabolic rate while you're sleeping, to slow your breathing. And this is all something that's very natural and will happen no matter what. But the way I describe it in that video is that Basically, it's inducing this sort of hibernating like state. It's making your body survive off of less oxygen. Obviously, you're not getting food while you're sleeping. So in this way, it's all very helpful. But to try to dramatically increase your levels of melatonin to fall asleep is not a very healthy thing to do. And more often than not, the reason that people aren't sleeping well throughout the night is because they do have a, a greater level of hormones like melatonin and cortisol, which interfere.
interfere with the regenerative processes that would occur during sleep if your metabolism was high. So the basic answer to your question is that so long as your thyroid is in good shape and you have a greater production of hormones like progesterone to that of estrogen and to that of cortisol, then you shouldn't experience really any sort of destructive effects from these stress hormones that rise while you're sleeping. So that's really the secret to good quality sleep is having a robust metabolism, something that is going to uh, outweigh any of the stressors of sleep and of darkness in general. So I usually recommend that if you're trying to get good quality sleep, don't take the route of you know using something like melatonin. It might make you drowsy, but it's sort of doing so in a, in a way that a tranquilizer would make you drowsy. It's not gonna be a very healthy way to fall asleep. And ultimately over time, you're suppressing your metabolism more and more, and this could lead to a lot of health issues. And it could also lead to sleep issues or uh, the inability to properly regenerate while you're sleeping. So in terms of falling asleep, staying asleep, the things you're gonna wanna look at is actually lowering the stress hormones. So ashwagandha, I know I talk about it a lot, but it's truly an adaptogenic overachiever. It sort of does everything you want your body to do or supports your body in all of its natural processes. And in regards to sleep, it's traditionally used as a sleep tonic with milk and honey because of its powerful anti-stress effects. So it has the ability to lower these stress hormones that otherwise keep you sort of wired and tired. Uh, the other thing you're gonna wanna look at is getting enough sugar and salt before bed to replenish the glycogen in your liver so that way you don't go into a stress response while you're sleeping. And so your liver has the energy it needs to perform all of its processes, its detoxification processes while you're sleeping without running into an energy deficit it. And the salts can be helpful for lowering any sort of adrenaline that might wake you up or contribute to symptoms of insomnia. So I think it's more important that you take a look at you know, lowering the stress hormones, uh, increasing your production of GABA, making sure your thyroid's working, and then you know, practicing sleep hygiene. So you know, making sure that you're not using blue light and computers before bed, you're not stimulating yourself before bed, eating too large of a meal before bed, exercising before bed, all of these things will hinder good quality sleep. So as long as you're doing these things, the use of melatonin is not necessary and is gonna probably have way more negative implications than it would helpful ones. So I definitely don't recommend it. It's not gonna be beneficial in the long term and it's not even really beneficial in the short term because most people's sleep problems have nothing to do with a melatonin deficiency. Melatonin is really just gonna act like a tranquilizer if anything. But if you're interested in learning more about melatonin's mechanisms, definitely be sure again to watch that video I made and go from there because I give some other tips in that video as well. All right guys, that brings this week's FAQ and Freebie Friday to a close. If you're interested in winning some free herbs or mushrooms, remember all you have to do is simply subscribe to the YouTube channel, give this video a thumbs up, and then just leave a comment or question in the comment section below. And really quick, I just wanted to announce that we did launch the pre-sale or the pre-enrollment to our new thyroid course that will be coming out soon, somewhere probably by the end of February or the latest by March 1st. So we're working on that course right now. We have been for a while creating the content and everything, but it takes time to film and edit it and produce it. But for all of our loyal subscribers and Vitaging family members, we're offering a pre-enrollment discount. So you're gonna get that course at a discounted rate if you enroll sometime between now and its actual physical launch. And we're gonna be working on a special package where you're gonna be getting a sort of quick start guide. So you're gonna get a PDF guide where you learn some of the fundamentals for good thyroid health. So that way you can get started now on some of the basic things you wanna to do to improve thyroid health. And these are a lot of things people are doing but they don't know are contributing to thyroid issues. So a lot of misguided but well-intended people, health conscious people, are giving themselves hypothyroidism but don't know it. I was one of them, so you're gonna learn about that in the quick start guide, but also in great detail in the course. And then we'll be offering a discount code for a thyroid bundle, where we'll be offering three different herbs that are all clinically proven to support the health of the thyroid. So this is a great incentive to pre-enroll now, and we'll have the course out sooner than later. Again, March 1st would be the very last day. That's when we're setting it to be released, but 
but I might get it done before then and I'll keep you guys updated through these videos or through email or through Instagram. So for those of you that have been you know, interested in thyroid health, we talk a lot about it as you know, a foundation for good overall health, definitely be sure to check that course out. You can find a link to it in the description box below where we talk about the course in greater detail. Otherwise, that does bring this video to a close. If you're interested in checking out any of our additional information and resources, you know, if I answered your question, remember we put the links to all of the studies we referenced in the description box below. We also have links to our online wellness academy, the tonic herb shop. So if I recommended any herbs for handling your particular situations, or if you're just looking for more information beyond this YouTube channel, we also have a blog. All of these things you can find in the description box below.